Jonah, welcome to the show. It's great to uh, be able to chat with you today. Now, you wrote uh, Liberal Fascism. That was your mm -hmm. first book. Uh, this is your second book. Uh, tell me why you wrote this book. Well, uh, Liberal Fascism was a lot of work. Uh, uh, you know, its detractors may not believe it, but it was actually, it took a lot of research, and I spent, as I like to joke, about six years, like Howard Hughes, with Kleenex boxes on my feet in my basement working on the <laughs> damn thing. And um, it's not a particularly entertaining book, Liberal Fascism. I mean, if you're compelled by the thesis, it's, it's, it, 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 it's a worthwhile read, I think. But I wanted to have a little more fun. And so, uh, in this book, I tried to have tried a little harder to be entertaining for the reader, at least for the kind of readers who like my stuff. And, um, and I also, it was interesting, I also, in some ways I've been saying that this is sort of like the liner notes to liberal fascism. The argument about liberal fascism is that as we define right wing in the Anglo-American tradition, uh, fascism wasn't right wing. We define right wing as two things, or two pillars of right wingness in American political life. Uh, um, Libertarianism, free markets, free values. Uh, the sort of Ron Paul. Small government, right, Ron Paul vision. Or the Pat Robertson vision. Social conservatism, family values, Christian conservatism, all that kind of stuff. And on both fronts, the fascists hated both of those things and saw themselves in opposition to both of them. Um, and yet American politics has sort of been distorted for the last century or so um, by this idea that the further you move away from the left, the closer you get to bad things. And one of the words we use for bad things is fascist, another one is racist, another one is homophobic, another one is sexist. And so in some ways, the best working definition of a fascist in American political life is simply a conservative who's winning an argument. <laughs> and, and so anyway, the other, I wanted to deal with the other arguments. Okay. And so this is a sort of a, I think there are 24 chapters on these various cliches that people use, sort of like the fascism one, as a way to sort of uh, rig, rig the argument in the war of ideas um, without actually um, making a serious argument up front. That is essentially cliches or sort of intellectually lazy arguments that are uh, sort of masquerading as non-ideological uh, points. Right, that's part of it, and that's definitely a big part of it. But it's also, you know, Orwell writes in Politics in the English Language, he doesn't use the word cliche, but he talks about euphemism and lazy metaphors, which is sort of the same thing. Uh, he says they come to us like prefabricated hen houses, and they end up doing our thinking for us. Um, if you if you buy into the idea without even knowing it that social justice is a serious and real concept, um, but at the same time it's just something nice and good that everyone should agree with, well then you've already, you sort of came into the movie 10 minutes before the ending because you've let someone else do an enormous amount of thinking for you because social justice is actually a deep ideological concept going back over a century. And you sort of begin this at a college campus, and you say this idea, you know, people, students would come up to you or, or during a lecture and they would, you know, say, I disagree with you, but I would defend your right to say uh, whatever you right. want to say to the death. Tell, tell me about those sorts sure. of experiences. And I mean, part of it is, yeah, so I, I, I speak on a lot of college campuses, and I have for a while. And one of the reasons, one of the reasons I wrote Liberal Fascism is because I was so fed up being called a fascist, you know. I mean, uh, even a cursory review of the literature, you know, would reveal that there weren't a lot of Nazi Goldbergs, you know, <laughs> and so, um, uh, and so I, uh, uh, but when I got on college campuses, one of the things I've really noticed is that these kids are, they're not just, they don't just have the tendency, they're trained. They're trained to be very skeptical of what they think is ideology. And so I'll say something like, um, I really think the only way to, defend, to, to maintain prosperity and our role in the world is to have a strong national defense. And kids will say, you know, that sounds like a really ideological statement. That's like peace through strength or something, right? Mm -hmm. and, and then they'll say, all I think is, you know, besides, I just think that violence never solved anything. As if that's not an ideological right. statement. And so... I, I mean, I'm a, that's, I've never heard that phrase from any uh -huh. violence never solved, but... Yeah. Okay, well, we'll come back to it. Yeah. Um, uh, or, you know, uh, the one I opened up the book with, you know, is, you know, I've had kids say to me, you know, Mr. Goldberg, I may disagree with what you have to say, but I will defend to the death your <laughs> right to say it. Yeah. And then they'll sit down as if they've, they've said <laughs> and something. Lots it, of applause. They'll apparently. be applauded, yeah, and the yeah. administrators in the back room will be nodding. Oh, he's a statesman. He's going to be, he, we're so proud of him. We've got to put him on the alumni magazine. And, um, and first of all, I don't believe him, right? I mean, this is sort of, this is what I call bravery on the cheap. Um, and you get it a lot on college campuses. These kids who are willing to denounce uh, the United States of America as a, you know, as a totalitarian regime or George Bush as a Nazi or a whatever, a dictator. Um, and the only reason they can do that is precisely because it's not true. In countries where, we do have where they do have dictators, you can't go around saying, 
you know, Kim Jong-il is an evil dictator, because you'll go to jail and die. You can do it in America because we have free speech and because we are, in fact, not a totalitarian country. Um, and, but second of all, you know, first of all, it's bravery on the cheap. It's a way of making me seem like, you know, some sort of l less impressive a person than this kid. But second of all, it's not true. I mean, is really is this kid going to take a bullet for me? Is some guy kind of going to come running in at the end of my speech and say Goldberg, and he's going no, and he's going to dive and take a bullet? No, he's not. And but lastly, it's a way of avoiding addressing anything that we've actually talked about. You know, it's a way it's a way of sounding like the better man without actually dealing with my argument. Same thing with things like better uh, better ten guilty men go free than one innocent go to jail. The principle behind that is one I think everybody agrees with, from the far right to the far left, that we live in a society where we should defend the rights of the accused, right? That we should have a benefit of the doubt in trials given to the accused, um, that you have to be beyond reasonable doubt when you convict somebody. I don't know anybody who disagrees with the principle. Right. It's how you apply the principle, right? I mean, as we see with, I mean, if, if it was an absolute principle, no one would be allowed to go to jail, because we know every now and then innocent people have been sent to jail. Or you have these phrases like, if it, if it saves the life of just one child, it's worth it. Um, well, first of all, it puts conservatives on the position of being like pro-dead kid. Um, but second of all, if that's the standard, then we have to wear bike helmets 24 hours a day, the speed limit has to be five miles an hour, and the guardrails on highways have to be 100 feet tall. Um, because that's the only way to guarantee that we'll save the life of even one child. And so these, these arguments, and I'm not saying that conservatives don't have cliches, I'm not saying that conservatives don't have bumper stickers, I'm not saying that politics isn't riven with this stuff, but the, the core difference between conservatives and liberals, I argue, and also libertarians and Marxists and socialists, um, uh, the core difference that sort of sets liberals apart, and I go into the intellectual history of this, is that liberals claim that they're not ideological. They claim that they're simply pragmatists, they only care about what works. Um, they think that you know, these ideological labels are what weird people hold and that liberals only care about you know getting the important things done and I think that that's not true I think everybody has an ideological perspective including liberals There's nothing wrong with having an ideological perspective um, but it seems to me as a matter of common sense that everywhere else in life if you want to know if you want to think seriously about something you think about your your biases. You, you try to own your biases. If you're thinking about taking a job, you ask yourself, do I like to work with my hands? Or am I a people person? Or would I be good at sales? Right? I mean, you, you do it a personal inventory of what you know about yourself and what you believe. And yet, when conservatives admit openly that they're ideological, that seems to their opponents as if proof that we can't think seriously about reality. And I would say that we can think more seriously about reality precisely because we know what our biases are. If you don't even know what your biases are, how do you know if you're thinking about reality seriously? Right. One of the biases I think that you see, at least in this campaign, in almost every election, is the bias towards independence, a bias toward you know, sort of the silent center and yeah. moderates. And you sort of say that's a bit of a sham. Yes. Um, I am not part of the cult of the center. Uh, I think that there is this absolutely bizarre fetishization that I think many people in your profession are part of the problem. Uh, I think there are a lot of mainstream, honest, decent uh, political reporters and journalists and gray beards and you know, David Gergen types who see, because they believe themselves to be centrist, and many of them actually are centrist, they give a place of privilege to the, the metaphorical center in American politics that A, I don't think it deserves. Uh, I mean, let's put it this way. I think anybody who knows anything about politics knows that the most contemptible people in politics, the most ridiculous people in politics, are those idiots at the, after the third presidential debate in late October, whenever it is, who form a focus group, who are the last undecideds, who've been listening to the campaign for two years, right? And you'll have Wolf Blitzer or, 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 or Brett Baer or Chris Wallace or somebody will ask, you know, go to this focus group and say, what did you think? And they'll be like, oh, I just wish I heard a little bit more about education. Or, you know, I, I, it was interesting, but I didn't hear him speaking to me about the environment. You know, I, don't, I didn't get a full understanding of what his position is on K through 12 education. You know, and at that point, if you don't know what these guys' positions are by late October, it's because you haven't paying either you haven't been paying attention or you're an idiot. And 
Um, it, it's your sense that they're sort of mugging for the camera. That they're they mugging, well, they're, know that they haven't, my only point is they might be perfectly decent people in their own lives and all that.